Welcome to another Penn State Wrestling Show here on the Blue White Illustrated YouTube channel and bluewhiteillustrated.com. I'm Thomas Frank Carr. That's Greg Pickle, our wrestling reporter, who's going to give you all the good info you're here for. Um, before we get started, because I always forget to do this at the beginning of the show, I get so excited to get into these topics because I'm learning along with maybe some of you who are watching uh, wrestling content for the first time uh, about all this stuff. But I do need to say, to begin, this show is is growing really fast and we're super excited and we're super appreciative of that that you keep yes. watching and coming back um help us out with that please if you're watching on youtube like the video subscribe to blue white illustrated's youtube channel we'll be providing you this content throughout the wrestling season uh things will get congested in the fall but we'll always make time for this particular show so please like the video and help us continue to build that stuff and of course bluewhiteillustrated.com your place to go to get information from greg pickle and the wrestling content we have a great deal going for anyone who listens to our podcasts and for anybody who uh is here on the youtube channel you sign up right now you get two months for a dollar to try everything out you get to go and talk to greg on the message board about wrestling use the promo code psu1 two months for one dollar at blue white illustrated Dot com. Greg, got all the formalities out of the way. Welcome to the show. Thanks for uh, your time. We're going to start with the NIL director position uh, that yes. Penn State is trying to fill for the wrestling team. Can you give us the, the facts about that to start, and then we'll get into a conversation about what it means for the program. Yeah, very interesting. So this job popped up on the Penn State uh, jobs portal maybe a week ago, a little less than that. Uh, the Penn State wrestling was seeking an NIL director, which, uh, as we all know, if you follow the football team, uh, Dan Kavala is kind of in that role without that title uh, for the football program. And of course, there's a lot of people involved with that from the, uh, you know, football side of things. Um, with basketball, you have different people involved. So this is not a new concept at Penn State, but it is new um, for the wrestling program. It has never had an NIL director before. Of course, before a few years ago, T. Frank, no one had anything close to an NIL director. Right. Um, so at least not on paper. Uh, so uh, this is an interesting step for the Nittany Lions. And, you know, I don't want to make too big of a deal about it because it's just way where college athletics is going. Um, but I do think it would be interesting to see who Penn State ultimately goes with for this role. Um, is it a former wrestler? Is it somebody who has ties to the wrestling program and a fundraising background? Is it, uh, you know, someone completely unconnected to the program? That feels unlikely, but I guess you never know. So yeah. it will be interesting to see because I do think this person is going to have some responsibilities aside from NIL. Just I think there's probably some portal uh you know work that they'll do and some recruiting uh, responsibilities that they will have so it feels like a little bit of a catch-all position mm -hmm. uh which is just where things are in college athletics in 2024 and you don't do clearly, one job right you right, do a bunch right. of different things you have one main job and then you do a bunch of right. other different things right and obviously uh you know kale sanderson casey cunningham cody sanderson do a lot of this stuff uh now that nick lee is on the staff he will as well but you know you almost just need to have somebody dedicated to this stuff in this day and age and it's mo you know i know we mostly had this conversation about football and um basketball but obviously at penn state wrestling it holds a special place in the hierarchy that it you know the sport just does not sit on that similar of a pedal stool with many other places so yeah you know i don't think you're going to be racing out to add this kind of a thing to every sport at Penn State or that other schools will necessarily be racing to do this for wrestling but certainly some are like Penn State and and will probably look into something similar so uh, it's an interesting thing to consider and it'll be very interesting interesting to see uh, who they end up going with so there's going to be a lot of questions I'm going to ask Greg that I are unfair because I don't think he knows the answer because these things are all very up in the air but the first thing that strikes me sitting here as we're talking about this is you're not allowed to to really manage NIL in-house in college athletics in terms of that's for the collective to do right now. There is a separation of church and state there. So is this a move to future proof when it does come in-house or is this, it, it, am I ignorant to things that guys are doing, uh, you know, staff members are doing on the football side and on the basketball side and now on the, the wrestling side where they can help facilitate these deals and opportunities for their players without being directly involved in violating any rules because Penn State has been pretty clear that they're not going to overtly subvert any of the NIL or transfer portal rules in order to gain an advantage. They've been trying to do things by the book and this kind of feels like I, I don't know where this lands. So how does all of this work? 
Yeah, I think it's as much about the future as it is anything else. But I also think that that's part of the reason why, if you look at the job listing, uh, and and you just think about the kind of like what we just talked about a minute ago, you know, this is kind of a catch-all position. So. It may be NIL director, but you could probably title it just about any number of, of things related to either recruiting, the transfer portal, or NIL, and it would be at least accurate for part of the job, certainly not all of it, uh, depending on which title you went with. Gotcha. But yeah, so you know, right now Penn State does have a director of ops, Adam Lynch, and I'm sure he was involved, like, and he's you know more I think logistics. Uh, mm-hmm. scheduling and travel and, and you know, schedules, things like that. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm sure some of this fell on his plate as well, and he'll be able to shift some of that off. That's just a guess on my part, but I would assume that's the case. So uh, it's just another set of hands. And, you know, okay. whether it's, uh, you know, having somebody focusing on the future in terms of where things are going, what's going to need to happen, and whether it's just another set of hands to help facilitate these things. Regardless, I just think that we're at a point where, Uh, You look at the football staff, it is incredible, and I know not everyone has access to old football media guides, but I was looking through the 2014 one the other day uh, for something totally unrelated and stumbled onto the staff page, and the football staff page then was one page in terms of (laughs) off-field staff, and now I think it fills up three or four, and they probably could fill five or six if they wanted to use, uh, you know, bigger photos or really list everyone that touches this thing, so I just think it's a... It's something that's been in football for a while. It has spread to basketball, and now I think it's schools uh, where they have a popular and successful uh, third sport, so to speak, is trending there. And for some schools, that may be baseball or softball or lacrosse or what have you. But, you know, I think you're just starting to see that uh, staff sizes have always grown for uh, for the power two sports in most yeah. places, yeah. football and basketball. And I think you're just starting to see a little bit more of that now. At, again, at schools that have other sports beside those two that they thrive at and are successful in. I think it's just interesting. There's there's a fine line between being a tinfoil hat person and noticing patterns and picking up on things that may be happening. Mike Mowdy joining the program, leaving from the, for the lack of a better term, pri- a private sector coming into the program to be a part of the uh, that particular staff uh, for the athletic department for you know football, but just raising money generally. And now you have this positional listing. It seems like there is some sort of prepping for the future of where things might be going with NIL coming in-house and all of the paying of players and things we've heard in college athletics over the last month or so. Uh, last thing I just want to ask before we move on to the U-20 and U-30 world team trials is – What's Penn State's wrestling NIL situation to start with? Like, where do you think they rank in terms of wrestling programs? Because they are obviously the crown jewel of the sport, but you get there by maintaining a lead and not letting up in any of these areas. So where is Penn State's wrestling NIL package compared to its competitors? Yeah, it's a great question because you look at, what Penn State did in the transfer portal last year, getting Aaron Nagao and Bernie Truax. And, you know, you would assume that part of the, you know, chance to come wrestle for Penn State, for Kale Sanderson and his staff, it's easy for me to say, uh, was a big draw of that. But you just also can't help but wonder if NIL was involved too. Uh, You know, we've seen lately a number of wrestlers, the three that are returning and some others uh, returning that had the chance to leave in terms of Bo Barlett, Carter Starachi, and Greg Kirkfleet, uh, announced their partnership with Happy Valley United, which I think, at least for me, and I I may just be, you know, I'm not the brightest ball, but, uh, you know, when you look at, you know, what those guys have been doing previously, I would have assumed they had some kind of an agreement with Happy Valley United. That was not the case. It is now, uh, or at least they just announced it publicly if it was the case before they did not put it out there. But we are starting to see more of that kind of stuff, and Bo Bartlett in particular with running camps. A lot of uh, Penn State wrestling guys uh, make money in in an NIL vein, through running camps during the off season, so that's a gotcha. big part of it. There is some apparel stuff. Carter Starachi is, uh, you know, involved with that too. He had some deals last year that we uh, talked about at BlueWhiteIllustrated.com. So, um, yeah, I would say it's fine. I mean, it's certainly, uh, you know, this position would indicate to me that it might be ready. He might be getting ready to take a next step. Um, but you know, the fact that. 
uh, Bo Bartlett, Carter Strachey, Greg Kirkfleet all could have moved on to whatever walk of life they, you know, whatever they chose, whether it was the NLWC yeah. and continuing to wrestle, whether it was coaching or whether it was just, you know, getting a job uh, full time outside of the wrestling world. Uh, the fact those guys all came back, I think probably is a good indication to most that there is certainly some money to be had on the NIL side of things at Penn State to make it worthwhile to come back yeah. besides just a competitive part of it. And, and that's, I think, an area where certain sports, and you mentioned non-revenue sports, as far as um, this is the highest level for some of these non-revenue sports that they're realistically going to see. Um, you know, wrestling, just generally, there's a lot of different paths you can take forward, but there's not an NBA or an NFL or an MLB. Uh, the money can be a little bit different for some of these other sports. Right. So maximizing that in college, NIL in college, I think, is, is an area where a lot of these uh, programs can make up some ground for their athletes and have a real incentive because everyone who's a wrestling fan is watching Penn State and they're watching uh, NCAA wrestling. So let's move on, though, to some of those other paths forward for uh, for wrestlers, and that is uh, the U-20 and U-23 World Team Trials. We'll get into this a little bit today. So what's going on uh, this weekend with the next tournament that Penn State players are going to be represented in? Yeah, so obviously we talked recently about the U.S. Olympic team trials. That fills the U.S. senior national team. Uh, so the, this week is the trials to fill the world team U.S. world team slots for uh, under-20 wrestlers and under-23 wrestlers. So Penn State, as you might imagine, will be well represented at this event. Uh, four Penn State class of 2024 recruits sit in the U-20 best of three finals. That's Luke Lillidal, P.J. Duke, Zach Ryder, and Connor Mirasola. And basically it's the same. Same thing there as if you remember David Taylor sat in the 86 kilogram finals and was waiting for someone to come out of the mini tournament to face him in a best two out of three final. That, of course, ended up being Aaron Brooks. Aaron Brooks won that match, got the 86 kilogram spot on the U.S. senior national team. David Taylor ends his competitive career by going to Oklahoma State afterwards. So we're talking the same kind of a deal here, just not going to the Olympics. You'd be going to the U-20 uh, Worlds and U-23 Worlds. Uh, if you make this team. So it's going to be interesting to see how uh, how this thing plays out. A lot of highly uh, respected wrestlers from across the country without Penn State ties will, of course, be in on hand in Ohio. This thing is going to be May 31st uh, through Sunday, June 2nd, uh, with the Penn State guys being on the mat uh, you know, at any point on Saturday and possibly Sunday as well. So uh, just a quick rundown here. I mentioned those four commits who are waiting in the finals. Uh, at 57 kilograms, uh, Penn State also has Kale Nisdeo, a current member of the roster in that weight class at this event. Uh, another current Nittany Lion at 61 kilograms, Kyson Garcia, 70 kilograms. Of course, P.J. Duke, the commit, is in the finals uh, waiting for someone to come out of uh, you know, that group will see Tyler Kasak, the Penn State uh, All-American third place finisher at 149 pounds. Um, last season is wrestling in this tournament at 70 kilograms, which is 157 pounds. So some eyebrows were raised there when it, he was at 157, not 149. I would urge people not to read too much into this. A lot of guys wrestle up a weight in the freestyle or the international freestyle um, competition, and it's very simple. They just don't. They want to eat during the summer. They don't want to cut weight <laughs> if they don't have to. So I wouldn't read too much into I it. Don't blame him. Does it? Yeah. Does it indicate that he could maybe one day wrestle at 157 at Penn State? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. But you know, I, I wouldn't read. I know the internet's already been a buzz about that, but I wouldn't read too much into it. We've seen plenty of guys bump up in weight. Uh, during the summer and then obviously return to their regular weight, uh, you know, once the uh, fall gets here and they're getting ready for the college season. So can I ask you about that? Um, yes. Are, are there any uh, implications, though, or what can we learn about the Penn State roster and some of these players, these these wrestlers through these competitions uh, that project to the fall and, and to the winter? So is there are there things that you can look for? You can learn about uh, uh somebody we're going to watch this weekend or is it really it's different and the situation is different so there's not as much to take from it 
Yeah, you can certainly learn some things from this. Uh, you know, like one example, uh, as we get going down the list here, uh, and this is at the U20 level, but Josh Barr is going to be competing at 86 kilograms, our Penn State wrestler who, uh, Kale Sanderson was adamant throughout much of last year that if there was a spot for him in the starting lineup, he was ready to go. Uh, and he did fill in for Bernie Truex a couple of times, but ultimately saved his red shirt. But how a guy like that competes in the summer uh, can really give you a good indication of what could happen in the fall uh, when he comes when it comes time for him to battle for a spot in the uh, in the Penn State lineup this winter. So I think that's really something interesting to watch. Um, and then from there, you know, I think that you look at some of these other guys that are en entered and Zach Ryder. You know, we talked about this before, seventy nine kilograms, who's waiting in that final. But um, you know, he is a guy who did not wrestle his high school senior season. So we get more opportunity, just like we did back when he earned this spot in the U-20 finals, uh, to see him compete and what he could bring to the Penn State wrestling program as gotcha. either a freshman or, uh, you know, somewhere down the road. So, yeah, to me, it's just, and then, you know, Counter Mirasola, the same thing at 92 kilograms. Uh, you know, what can we learn about him as he projects to try and win a roster spot uh, at Penn State this season? So, Or not a roster spot, a starting spot, rather. So, uh, very interesting. And then kind of the same thing if we move on quick to the U23s. Like, Aaron Nagal is entered there. So is Gary Steen at 61 kilograms. Yeah. Uh, he could face Nick Buzakis again. They were 1-1 one and one against each other uh, this previous season in the college level. Uh, you know, Matt Rodriguez is in at 65 kilograms. Connor Pierce at 70 kilograms. Eric Gibson is interesting at 79 kilograms. He came to Penn State from Cornell, took a gap year, and uh, is going to try and compete for uh, a starting spot this year as well. So interested to see what he can do. Lucas Cochran, a guy we've talked about as a potential villain. Or starter for Penn State in the way well, has been a fill-in, could be a starter for Penn State in the upper weights at 92 kilograms. And then defending NCAA champ Greg Kirkfleet is also entered in the U23 tournament. He is in the 125 kilogram weight class. So just curious to see what he looks like uh, on the freestyle stage and what he's capable of doing at this event. Uh, any final thoughts? What's coming up from you for Penn State Wrestling? What are you following on this week over at BlueWhiteIllustrated.com? Anything else that we didn't talk about today? Yeah, the between the NIL director and the U20 and U23 uh, U.S. Uh, World Team Trials, that's really has the focus for the most part this week. But, uh, you know, we'll also be continuing our weight by weight uh, outlook series, which I know we'll get into here more in, on future shows when we don't have as much news to talk about. But, uh, yeah, we'll be keeping an eye on that and seeing what else, if anything, happens uh, in the Penn State wrestling world. Certainly we'll be following the U20 and U23 uh, event and we'll have results at BlueWhiteIllustrated.com. Yeah, that's uh, this year, not so much. There's been something to talk about every single week with a lot of different wrestlers and a lot of different uh, tournaments. So, again, stay tuned. Locked into BlueWhiteIllustrated.com. For Greg Pickle, I'm Thomas Rancar. We'll be back on the next Penn State Wrestling Show.